In this recording, I'll go over the steps for drawing a network di diagram, uh, conducting a forward pass, backward pass, and then defining your critical path. First off, let's uh, start by understanding some of the terminologies used when creating a network diagram. So the first term we have here uh, is successors. So let's uh, take um, activity D as an example here and work with that. So for activity D here, as if, if we're talking about activity D and we ask for a successor of activity D, um, that would be activity E. Activity E is a successor of activity D. So the next uh, term is predecessor. So predecessor to activity D are activities that come before activity D. So in this example, activity B and C are both uh, predecessors to activity D. Next term is uh, the network diagram. The network diagram is the term that describes this entire uh, drawing that we have here. This entire drawing here is called a network diagram. Next term is serial activities. Serial activities are activities that happen one after the other. Um, one activity must be completed before the start of the next. So an example of serial activities in this network diagram are activities uh, D, E, and F. Uh, these activities um, can only happen, so activity D has to be complete before the start of activity E, and activity E must be complete before you can start activity F, and that describes serial activities. On the other hand, concurrent activities are activities that could be happening simultaneously. So in this particular network diagram, uh, both activity B and C are concurrent activities, uh, which indicates that they can be uh, done concurrently or at the same time. A few more uh, terms to consider here. Let's uh, look at the first one, merge activities. Merge activities, um, in this example, oh, in this network diagram, uh, activity D would be a merge activity. And merge activities are uh, those that have predecessor, more than one predecessor uh, flowing in uh, to, activity, uh, to the activity. So in this example, activity D is a merge activity. And the reason for that is you have two more than one predecessor um, that need to be completed before the start of activity D. Uh, therefore, activity D is a merge activity. A burst activity in this example is activity A. Um, activity A is a burst activity because it, you must complete activity A before you can start activity B or activity C. So any activity that has more than one successor is called a burst activity. A node is, in this example, um, activities A, B, C, D, E, and F all fall on nodes. Um, so a, a node is, in this example, represented by a circle. A path is represented by the arrow in this diagram. So a path indicates as to uh, the flow um, of the activity. So upon completing, for example, upon completing activity D, um, this particular arrow here identifies that this is the direction as to we will proceed with our network uh, diagram. Critical path is the path that is the represents the shortest possible time uh, for us to complete a, a, uh, a project and we'll cover that a little, in a little bit more detail in a few slides. So here's a couple of examples. The first uh, option here, option A, the first example, we have serial activities. So again, as described earlier, these are activities that happen one after the other. You must fully complete activity A prior to commencing activity B and so on 
and so forth until you reach the end of your project. In the second uh, example, option B, uh, we have an example of uh, concurrent or, or uh, uh, non-serial activities. So in this example, um, after uh, upon completing activity C, you can simultaneously start on two separate activities. These are activities uh, D and E. Um, so you could run two activities at the same time. And you're, you, the, this is uh, very important because it allows you to uh, shrink the overall length of your project. Um, again, it's, uh, it's uh, by drawing a network diagram and identifying tasks that can be done concurrently um, helps you shrink your overall length of the, of the project. There are typically two different types of uh, network diagrams available. Uh, the first, uh, in the blue here, we have uh, activity on arrow diagram. This particular network diagram is, uh, is not commonly used nowadays. Uh, it was uh, prior to the adoption of uh, scheduling software such as MS Project. Uh, this activity or this network diagram was uh, was common. The differences uh, are um, your activities happen um, on the arrow. So here in a blue diagram, activity B happens or is represented uh, by this arrow. Um, and uh, there are no activities happening on, on the node. The second example in the red, your activities happen on the node. So for activity B, it happens on the node. Um, and the arrows represent the path of your, uh, of your project. And like I mentioned, the second uh, example here, the activity on node, Diagrams are more common, uh, and we will be using this this network diagram uh, for the rest of this uh, presentation. As you work with activities, uh, activity on on node diagrams, uh, there is a, a node labeling convention that is uh, that is used in in project management. So as you draw your node, uh, we typically draw the node in a, as a square, or sorry, as a rectangle. And we uh, identify certain par uh, parameters for, for the, the node uh, by placing uh, the information in specific locations on that rectangle uh, to indicate what, what they mean. So um, for example, um, we had uh, in, in the previous slide we have acti we had activities uh, labeled A, B, C, and so on. Um, so, for example, we if we are drawing out a network uh, a node, uh, we would label it as such. Uh, we would place the the label ID in the top center uh, of the rectangle. And if we had information about this activity, a description of the activity. Uh, we would place that in the center of the uh, node. And then we have uh, five additional pieces of, uh, uh, of information, sorry, six additional pieces of information that we would uh, uh, also add to this uh, node. The activity duration, so if the activity A takes five days to complete, we would write uh, five to indicate the duration of this activity. Uh, and then we have uh, early start, early finish, late start, late finish. We will go over these in a little bit more detail in the next uh, few slides here. Um, and then activity float uh, is what helps us determine the, the critical path uh, in, the, in the network. So here's an example, a typical example that you would receive of, uh, of a project uh, and you would be asked to uh, draw a network diagram for. So we have eight activities and um, they're labeled you know, activity A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Uh, and then we have a description of each activity. And then in the third column, 
uh, you'd see information here about the predecessor. So the predecessor tells us uh, the activities that have to be completed uh, prior to commencing uh, each activity. So for activity A, uh, we have a predecessor of none. Uh, therefore, there's no activities that uh, come before activity A. And that would indicate to us that activity A is the first activity in the on the, on the project. For activity B, a, it has a predecessor of activity A. What that tells us is activity B cannot start until the completion of activity A. And that's how you would read this information. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a, a run at uh, drawing this network diagram. So as I indicated, activity A has uh, no predecessor and therefore it would be the first activity in our network diagram. So we would draw a rectangle here. Um, we've uh, we've uh, said that uh, the labels go up in the top center of the rectangle. Next activity we have is activity B and activity B has a predecessor which is activity A therefore it would come next for activity C it also has a predecessor which is activity A so we draw activity C um, as such um, and we don't forget to add the our path to indicate how the project will flow. Next we have activity D. Activity ha D is a merge activity. It has two predecessors. And the predecessors are B and C. Next we have activity E. And the predecessor for activity E is activity B. Therefore, our path would go this way. Activity F uh, has a predecessor, which is activity D. So activity F can be drawn right here. And our path would go this way. Next is activity G. Activity G also has a predecessor, which is activity C. So our arrow would go as such. And then the last activity we have is uh, activity H, and it has three predecessors. So again, it's a, uh, it's a merge activity. Let's draw uh, activity H right here. And our arrows would... Uh, would go this way. So three predecessors, activities uh, E, F, and G. So this is how we go about uh, drawing our network diagram. So here it is, the uh, completed network diagram with the uh, descriptors for each activity. Next, uh, in order for us to identify the critical path on the uh, on the network, uh, we need to conduct a couple of uh, um, iterations here. The first uh, is the forward pass, uh, and then we conduct a backward pass. And uh, once we've uh, done both both those activities, we can determine what our critical path uh, on the on the project is. So the forward pass is an additive move. So we, we add the duration and the early uh, start of, uh, of each activity. Um, and then we work our way all the, from the first activity all the way to the, the last activity on the project uh, and determine uh, what our early finish time for the project is. And the backward pass, we uh, start from the very last activity and then work our way um, to the to the start. 
So there's a few rules for conducting a forward pass and, uh, and a backward pass. So for the, for the forward pass, the first rule is, uh, and if you recall our uh, labeling information we have, we indicated that uh, the description goes up in the top center and then we have our early start in the top left corner and we have our early finish in the top right corner so uh, and then we have our duration in the bottom center so the first rule here says early start plus duration gives you early finish um, so in this example early start you add your duration and that will give you your early finish next rule tells us that the early finish of a predecessor is equal to the early start of a successor so sorry I don't have much room here so let's say this is our next activity um, activity B second rule is telling us that the early finish of your predecessor is equal to the early start of your successor so whatever number that ends up in this corner, in the top right corner of activity A, uh, we would simply transfer it over to the, to the top left corner of activity B. The third rule is, is an exception to the, uh, the second rule. So the, third rule is telling us that if you have uh, a merge activity if uh, let's say activity B was a, a merge activity so let's say there was another activity here that also flows into activity B the third rule is telling us that uh, um, in this circumstance if you're if you if you have a decision to make as to which early finish value to take, um, you always take the the largest early finish value. As we uh, go through our network diagram, we will have a better explanation of, of uh, what to look for. Now, the uh, the backward pass. Um, is really the reverse of, of uh, what we've discussed in the forward pass. So for a backward pass, you typically start at the, uh, the last um, activity in your network diagram. So let's say this is activity H. And um, you have a few more activities. The rules are um, your late finish minus your duration will give you your late start so if our late finish for example uh, was 30 days and the duration for activity H was 5 uh, we would subtract 30 minus 5 and that would give us 25 as a late start for activity H. So that's the first rule. Second rule is late start of successor activity is equal to the late finish of a predecessor. So again, if this is the uh, uh, the late finish for uh, the predecessor activity we simply transfer this number over to late finish now let's look at the uh, third rule so again the third rule is kind of the an exception to the second rule so this third rule is telling us if you're if you're at a, um, a if you're going backwards to a burst point so 
Uh, let's draw a brisk point here. And you've already uh, identified your uh, your late starts at each of these activities. Um, you have a decision to make. Uh, which of these numbers do you transfer over as a late finish for this burst activity? And the third rule is telling you that uh, you pick the smallest of these three uh, late starts and then you transfer over to your late finish of a, of a uh, successor um, or sorry a, a predecessor uh, activity. Again as we, uh, as we conduct a forward pass and a backward pass uh, this stuff might well make a little bit more sense. So again a reminder of our, of our node labeling so the ID goes to the top uh, center of the uh, of the of the node. Your duration goes in the bottom center. Early start, early finish, late start, and late finish. Um, and then we'll talk about activity float as we um, draw out our network diagram. Your activity float. Uh, to calculate your activity float, uh, you do so by um, so activity float is equal to your late start minus early start or you can also use your late finish minus your early finish to get your activity float. Again, so this is the same network diagram we've been working with, and here we're going to start with a forward pass, and I'll show you how you could do that. So any project uh, must always start at time equals zero, so it has an early start of time equals zero. Um, so you always start your network diagram with an early start of, the first activity would have an early start of time equals zero. Now let's start off with our uh, with our forward pass. So again, based on the rules we've discussed, we need to uh, as we as we conduct our forward pass, we're identifying two information pieces of information for each activity. And um, so our forward pass, we define our early start and our early finish for each activity. And then when we do our backward pass, we identify another two pieces of information, and that is our late start and our late finish for each activity. So let's start off with a forward pass. We've identified here the early start for activity A. Uh, we need to define the early finish for activity A. So based on the rules we've discussed, early finish is equal to early start plus duration gives you your early finish. So in this case, it's 0 plus 5 gives you 5. Now we continue on with our network diagram. Uh, let's look at activity B. So uh, we need to determine the early start for activity B. So based on the uh, second rule and of our forward pass, the early start of activity B is equal to the early finish of activity A. Um, so really all we're doing is we're taking this 5 and transferring it over up here. And we do the same for activity C. We transfer that 5 over. Let's uh, determine. Let's go back to up to activity B and determine the early finish. Uh, early finish is uh, five plus the five gives you ten. Down to activity C, five plus the six gives you an early finish of eleven days. Now let's look at activity D. We need to determine the early start for activity D. 
Uh, you'll notice that activity D is a merge activity. And uh, there's an exception to the rule that we've just uh, covered here. Um, and whenever you're at a merge activity, uh, you have to make a decision as to which do you take uh, the early finish of which predecessor uh, do you carry over uh, to activity D. So in this example, uh, we have either 10 or 11. Uh, and the rule tells us is uh, the rules the rule tells us that you take the uh, largest of the two. So for activity D, the early start is 11 days. And we carry on 11 plus 13 gives us 24. Let's go up to activity E. Activity E we simply carry over the uh, uh, the 10 from activity B. Uh, so now activity E has an early start of 10 days. Plus 6 gives us an early finish of 16 days. Let's go down to activity uh, F. So activity F, the early start is 24 days. So we carry over the uh, 24. Going down to activity G, early start is 11 days. Again, we carried over 11 from the from the predecessor. Now let's go look at activity F here. Um, activity F, the early finish is 24 plus 4, which gives us 28 days. Going down to activity G, 11 plus 9 gives us 20 days. Now we look at our last and final activity in this network diagram activity H. Uh, we need to determine the early start for activity H. We realize that activity H is a merge activity uh, and there's three predecessors and we need to determine uh, which early um, start we should take for activity H and the rule tells us we take the largest of the three early finishes uh, and we carry that over as an early start for activity H. So in this case uh, that's 28 days. 28 plus 2 gives us an early finish of 30 days. And now we've successfully completed our forward pass. All right, now uh, let's uh, go ahead and uh, do a backward pass. So the backward pass uh, we really start at the end of the network diagram and then we work our way backwards and uh, we, we're really reversing what we did with the uh, forward pass. So for the, uh, the backward pass we start at activity H and we need to determine the late finish for activity H. So for, for activity H what we do is we take that 30 and we move it down and that is the late finish for activity H. And the reason why we do that is um, after we've conducted our forward pass, uh, we determine that the earliest possible finish time for activity H is 30 days. We also want that to be the latest possible time for us to finish the project um, in order for us um, to keep the project as short as possible without delaying uh, the project. And that's why we move the early finish down um, and use that as our late finish for uh, our uh, for activity H. Continuing on with our backward pass, um, we're going to do opposite to what we've or the reverse of what we've done for our forward pass. Uh, so what we do here, we take the late finish, subtract duration, and that would give us the late start. So and for activity H, 30 minus 2 would, gives, would give us a late start of 28. Now we'll carry forward uh, and uh, continue to uh, identify the late starts and late finish uh, for the remaining activities. So let's take a look at um, activity E. Uh, what late finish value should we take for activity E? Uh, based on the rule for a backward pass, 
um, the uh, the late start of the successor activity is equal to the uh, late finish of the predecessor. So for activity E, uh, we're simply taking 28 and carrying it over. Taking a look at activity F, same thing, we take uh, the 28 from activity H and carry it over and then same thing for activity G. It's got a late finish of 28 days. Up at activity 6, take 28, subtract 6, uh, we have a late start of 22 days. Uh, going over to activity F, 28 minus 4 gives us 24. Down to activity G, 28 subtract 9 give us 19. Let's take a look at activity D. So again, activity D we carry over. That's 24. So 24 subtract 13 give us 11. Let's go up to activity B. Activity B is a burst activity and uh, the rule tells us whenever you're doing a backward pass and you're at a burst activity uh, you have to determine which late start value uh, do you take which predecessor's late start value do you take and carry over as a late finish for activity uh, B and in this case we have two options we have either 11 days or 22 days the rule tells us we pick the smaller of the two so in this case we take the late start for activity D and move it over as a late finish for activity B and we write the 11 in the bottom right corner there. Going down to activity C, again similar situation. We have two options that we can uh, uh, we can select from. We have either 11 days or 19 days, and the rule tells us you take the smallest of the two. Therefore, we have 11 days. Back up at activity B, 11 subtract 5 uh, equals to 6. Down to activity C, 11 subtract 6 uh, gives us a late start of 5 days. Up at uh, activity A, again activity A is a burst activity. Two options that we can uh, select from, either 5 or 6. Um, in this case, we'll take. Well, in, in every case, we take the smallest of the two. Um, so we take the five. So five subtract five uh, gives you a late start of zero days. And now we've successfully conducted our backward pass. You'll notice that both the early start and the late start for activity A, which is the first activity on our node, um, are always zeros. And, and what this tells us is whenever you get a project you want to start it at time zero. You don't want to delay the start of your project because if you delay the start of your project um, you will delay your overall um, duration of the project. So um, the earliest you can start it with zero days and the latest you can start it is also zero days. So now we've uh, we've successfully conducted the forward pass and a backward pass. Now we need to determine what our critical path is. And in order for us to do so, we need to determine the float or the slack uh, or the buffer uh, time for each activity. So there's um, three different terms that uh, you you might come across uh, and they all mean the same thing so um, buffer 
is also equal is it means the same thing as uh, slack and also means the same thing as uh, float so you might see either of these three terms um, in different uh, textbooks or um, different articles but they all mean the same thing in order for us to determine the float for the activity um, so we, we've uh, uh, we've um, already mentioned that uh, your float is either your uh, equal to your late start minus your early start or you can also use your late finish minus your early finish to determine your float so let's uh, start off with our first activity activity a um, my late start subtract my early start is um, 0 subtract 0 which gives me a float of 0 and again based on our, our node labeling convention uh, the float is in the uh, we, we write the float amount in the um, on the left hand side of the rectangle uh, right down the center right here let's uh, go up to activity B our float is 6 which is my late start, subtract 5, which is my early start, and that gives me a float of 1. Going down to activity C, 5, subtract 5, gives me 0. Over to activity D, 11, subtract 11, gives me a float of 0. Activity E, 22, subtract 10, gives me a float of 12 days. Down to activity F, 24 subtract 24 gives me a float of 0. Activity G, 19 subtract 11 gives me a float of 8. Over to activity H, 28 subtract 28 gives me a float of 0. So now we've determined the float for each activity. Um, in order for us to de determine what the critical path is, we need to understand um, the reason why we've determined the float uh, and what is the meaning of a float. So let's take a look at activity B. Activity B has a float of one day. Uh, the float of one day means that if we s delay activity B by one day, it will not affect any of its successor activities or it will not delay any of its successor activities. So the successor activities for activity B are activity D and E. So if we delay the start time or the completion time of activity B by one day, um, we will be able to to, to move forward with our project um, on time without delaying it. But if we delay activity B any longer than one day, that will certainly affect um, activity D. So if activity B is delayed by two days, um, it means that it will have a late, a late finish of 12 days. Um, 12 days means um, activity D cannot start until the 12th day as well and therefore activity D will be delayed uh, which will uh, subsequently delay all the all its uh, successor activities and therefore delay the completion of the project. So this is how a, the float is uh, particularly important uh, for us to know and, and understand um, the, the float amount at each activity. So get, having given you the uh, explanation for what the float uh, means, um, let's uh, explain what a critical path is. Critical path means that it is the path um, on the, in, the, in the network diagram uh, which is it, which if any of these activities are delayed on that path will cause the delay of the entire project. Uh, another way to describe that is um, you know any activity uh, activities that fall um, on a, uh, all the activities that have a float of time zero um, 
on on any on any path through to the end of the project um, will determine the critical path. Another way to describe that is um, any path in a network diagram that has um, activities that all have a float of zero represents the critical path. So let's take a look here in this example. Uh, the critical path we can we can start off by identifying the activities that have a zero float. So let's activity A has zero float. So it means that this activity is going to be on a critical path. Let's move uh, forward and identify the the successor activities that also have a zero float. Um, in this case, activity C also has a zero float. This means that activity C will also be on a critical path. Moving forward, activity D is also on a critical path. Activity F is also on a critical path. And activity H is also on a critical path. So if you're asked to identify the critical path, um, you would uh, obviously you know, go through the forward pass, backward pass, identify float, and then mark out your critical path. And then to communicate that to someone, uh, you can simply say, uh, or you would write, um, you know, a critical path is equal to A, C, D, F and H. So this is my critical path. ACD FH is a critical path. If I follow this path on the network diagram, uh, it would mean that I am walking on the critical path. So any of these activities in this path, uh, if they, they are delayed, um, they will delay the overall uh, time of the project. However, um, activities uh, B, activity E and activity G are not on the critical path. And the float tells us by how many days they can be delayed before they start impacting the overall duration of the project. So activity B uh, can be delayed by one day prior to um, it starting to being on the critical path um, and delaying the, uh, the uh, completion of the project. Activity E can be delayed by 12 days without impacting the overall duration of the project. And activity G can be delayed by eight days before it starts impacting the uh, completion of the project. So now that we've also successfully completed our, our critical path method. So now that we've uh, determined the critical path um, it's also important to consider uh, ways to reduce that critical path because if you can reduce your critical path, you will also reduce the overall time for completing your project. So if it's very critical for your client um, to complete a project ahead of uh, schedule, one of the first things you would look at as a project manager is how can I shrink that critical path? And uh, these are some of the ways you can uh, uh, look at um, for reducing that critical path. So eliminating activities on the critical path will shorten your, your critical path or reduce your critical path. Uh, we've talked about serial versus uh, parallel activities. Um, so concurrent versus non-concurrent activities. So if you can convert some of the series activities, so activities that go one after the next, um, after the next, if you can convert that into uh, parallel activities, so activities that go as such, um, this will help you shorten or reduce your uh, critical path. Um, so again, either converting serial to parallel activities, um, overlapping your sequential tasks uh, would mean the same thing. Uh, shorten the duration of each activity on the on a critical path. So 
Um, if you're if you're one of the activities on your critical path takes ten days to complete. Uh, if you can pay a little bit more by getting more people to work on that activity and complete it in eight days, uh, that would allow you to shrink the uh, duration for the activity, reduce that duration for the activity, and therefore reducing the uh, duration of your overall uh, of your overall project. If you shorten the first um, task in your project, um, uh, that would allow you to uh, reduce your your uh, critical path. Uh, you know, reducing the longest tasks, uh, taking a look at the easiest tasks to reduce, uh, looking at tasks that have a uh, the least cost to speed up. Um, uh, that would uh, uh, give you, I guess, the better bank for your buck as you as you work uh, towards reducing your critical path.